Hello, um, hi everybody. Welcome to our book launch this evening. I'm very, very pleased to welcome you here. Um, we are, of course, launching Phoebe Powers' second collection, Book of Days. Uh, so thank you very, very much for joining us. Uh, Phoebe is, of course, here. And we're also joined by Sarah Cave, um, who is going to be on screen in just a moment. I'm just going to run over some housekeeping um, and let you know what's going to happen this evening. So um, this event will last about one hour tonight. Um, and Please, I can see that Michael has put a message uh, to make me begin in the chat box. Find the chat box for us. Um, please make sure you select everyone on the drop down so that we can all read each other's messages. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know what you think of the reading and the book if you've already got your copy. Um, just please get involved in the conversation there. Um, so this evening, uh, Phoebe is gonna read for us. And while she's reading, I'm gonna have the text up on screen for you as a bit of a visual guide. So please just be aware that you're in control of your screen if you need to make Phoebe's face bigger, if you need to lip read or anything, you can do that. Um, have a play around and you should be able to configure it to your needs. If you have any problems, uh, drop them in the chat and I'll try my best to help you throughout the event as well. Now, after Phoebe's reading, she's going to have a bit of a conversation with Sarah about the book. Um, and again, we would like you to be involved later on in the event. So if you could find another button which says Q&A, it's different to the chat box. It says Q&A and you could get your questions lined up for Phoebe in there. Um, and later on in the event, Sarah will be able to put them to Phoebe. And we can get you properly involved in the conversation that way. So um, I think that's kind of everything um, that I need to tell you. I'm very, very delighted to introduce Sarah Cave. Um, Sarah is a writer and editor and a candle maker. Um, she's published four pamphlets and two book length collaborations, as well as two full collections. Um, the first was called An Arbitrary Line, and that came out with Broken Sleep in 2018. And the second was Perseverance Valley, um, which came out from Knives, Forks and Spoons in 2020. So if you don't know Sarah's work, um, go and check it out, please. Uh, but for now, I'm delighted to welcome her on screen um, and we'll begin. Thank you Jazz. Hello everyone um, and, and I just want to say a quick thank you to Phoebe as well. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to be launching her book with her but um, I'm mostly just going to jump straight into introducing her now because I think we're all very excited to hear her read from Book of Days. Um, okay, so of course many of you already know Phoebe, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna mention some of her achievements and publications anyway. Um, so in 2009, Phoebe won the Foyle Young Poets Award, and in 2012 she won the Eric Gregory Award. Her first pamphlet, Harp Duet, was published in 2016, and was shortly followed by Shrines of Upper Austria, for which she was shortlisted for the T. S. Eliot Prize, and she won the Forward Prize for first collection and it's brilliant. Um, and I had the pleasure of seeing Phoebe perform extracts from that um, at the Bob and Moore Poetry Festival. And, you know, she's just, just a wonderful reader. Um, in 2021, I had the pleasure of publishing uh, Phoebe's collaboration with Katrina uh, Porteous, who I think I noticed might actually be here this evening. Um, and, that brings us up to the present day uh, and book of days and it's just such a fabulous book um, consisting of a long poem broken into segments with occasional detours recounting Phoebe's long journey along the Camino de Santiago which runs through the northern part of Spain. The poem is the glorious tapestry of fellow pilgrims voices, soundscapes, memories, songs, sketches of the landscape and architecture. And when I read it, I just, it just blew me away. Um, and I'm gonna hand straight over to Phoebe now because let's, let's hear it. Let's, let's hand over to Phoebe. Hello, um, I hope you can see me. I can't see myself, but I think that's fine. <laughs> um, it's really, yay, thank you, Susanna. Okay. Um, Hello, it's really, really lovely to be here on Zoom. And I'm really um, so glad that you could come and, and be with me today. It means a lot to me that you're here. Um, 
and I'm really excited to share um, my new, new book, um, Book of Days, um, and celebrate it this evening. Um, as Sarah said, um, Book of Days is really a long poem. Um, so I'm going to be reading extracts from a, from a long poem um, rather than individual sort of separate poems, really. Um, and I'll be sort of taking us through, um, through the narrative. Um, so hopefully you'll get a sense of how the kind of arc of the poem progresses um, through the book. Um, and thank you. Yeah, so I've got the text. So here's the text. I'm going to start um, by sharing some of the reasons that people decide to go on the Camino. Um, this book is not just um, my voice, it's the voice of many others. My mum is here with me. You can't see her, but she's here. I am here to ask God what he would like me to do. I don't know the reason yet, but I will. I'm not happy in my job. I'm here because my wife said it would be good for me. I'm here to look after Noreen, my wife. I'm here with my brother from South Africa. I'm here to celebrate being able-bodied with my mom. I'm carrying dad's ashes. I'm about to turn 50. I survived cancer. We want to do this while we still can. I've been working for the past six years for the internet and I'm always on the internet. So I want a break from the internet. I've just turned 60 and I want to see what else life has to offer. As you get older, you realize what's important is people and I'm here to spend time with my buddy, Lisa, Anna, Kate, Claire, Tokla, Rachel, Gay, Cecilia, Sven, Jerry, Noreen, Laurie, Matt, Marta, Gurnall, Beau and more. all set off together, start in the same grey promise, walking in one irregular string up the mountain, first one, then another further ahead, then twos and threes, then another one, figures climbing with their packs of every colour, maroon, turquoise, purple, yellow. Mostly we keep the silence, breathing up the hillside, like a moving monastery, cattle bells, tongue continually. At dawn, the cattle settle by the side of the path. Who comes today? They take photos, carefully creep by or barge through, transmit respect. The cattle let all pass. Claire peels off another way to swim in the view alone resenting those who follow her. We watch from above and come to the Virgin where the Norwegian ladies sing from hymn sheets among the rocks. Folk from the coach parked up take their picture. Frailer women with makeup and drawstring bags get out to photograph the statue's space, but she looks outward to guard the mountain. You cannot see her face. So the numbers at the top of the page um, refer to the day, the number of days. So altogether, there are 40 days of, of the walk. Um, so this is number 10. Blue and orange, gold, and the gold coming down, filling up the red, leaves, and matching my geranium shirt, ocean, blue shorts. People still try to take pictures of the sun, clicking along with their sticks. And I think about Stainton, C of E primary school, the hymn books that were so surprising to me, their soft covers printed in blue, book one, or green, book two. 
titles printed with a chalk effect and drawings of laughing children with bowl cuts. They soon got a new, plainer set with glossy covers and by the time I left the school we were singing along to CDs. When I was six, I found it hard to read the words at the same time as singing them. I didn't know the tunes and I sang the word chorus. In assembly, we put our palms together to pray and I watched the skin on my wrists wrinkle up in folds. We peeped as our head teacher, Mr. Shelton, closed his eyes and could not see us. We eyed him in his resolute quietness as he spoke on our behalf. We watched him. He was at our mercy. And hearing the grace the first time, Mrs. Grant's abrasive, for what we are about to receive. And the children bang their lunchboxes, ball, may the Lord make us truly thankful, then pop their cheesy watsits. I didn't understand the incantation, its strange grammar and call and response. It was the same the first time I participated in Evensong and the Psalms were sung with breaths in certain places according to the commas and I didn't know the words of the creed or the confession which were not printed anywhere. Recorded singing adds to the dead feel. Old retablos hanging off the walls. All the saints are strong, white knights with polished heads. The Virgin de Nieva with a crisp silver head. John from Hull joins us for dinner. He's compact and muscular, doing it all in 14 days with a tent. Why, we wonder. Well, I'm a fit lad and wanted more of a challenge. Philip arrives, sorry, I've been at mass. He works in Dublin with ex-offenders. Have you met the jailers? Ah, no, but I'd know them. There's not enough room for everyone's plate, wine, water and bread. John's water tips over the paper placemat. I'm a born again Christian, he's saying faith. That's why I'm really doing it. I should have said that before. He scrambles from the table, skipping dessert and sets off in the dark again. He'll camp on the path between towns, wherever he happens to land. Well, I couldn't do that as a woman, says Caroline. I came because I wanted to prove to myself that I could now that I'm 60. My father used to take us in the car and just drive. He had that adventuring spirit. My mum still worries that I always had that spark of adventure in me. Philip's plate of fish peers over the edge of the table and tips up onto the floor. No dinner for a hungry pilgrim. But the kitchen whips up another. Flash fried, Philip says, and it's fresher, more delicious than the first. So a lot of people begin walking the Camino on their own, um, but very quickly you meet other people and you tend to meet the same people as you go along. Um, but you maybe see somebody one day and then um, not, not see them for a few days or a week or even a few weeks and then see them again. So there's this kind of weaving, weaving of people's lives and weaving of, of, of people's paths. Um, so this section um, kind of tries to capture some of that. Hillary's in the bunk above mine, her feet a mess of blisters. We're the last to leave in the morning, stumbling through forest. She's a full-time mum with her youngest about to go to college. So what will she do now? She came for answers and was assaulted by fears. Two beautiful old oak trees, a pair as if married, canopies blurred together over the pink dawn valley. The cold sends us indoors for black tea and something to eat for breakfast. The girl is there with the haze of gold hair tied back. She tells us she got ill a few days ago and slept for 22 hours with a fever. Her body had to get sick, now she feels lighter. Her voice is wondering and generous, like the edge of a wave over sand. And Lisa and I walk on together. She explains that her mood's been up and down like a teenager. Sometimes she prefers to walk by herself, but then she misses people, thinks maybe they don't like me. 
Yes, I say, I know. The sometimes alone, sometimes together, sometimes two and sometimes many, sometimes three or four, and sometimes alone, the lurch and throw of it. There is a turning with no arrow. While we waver, a guy catches up to us. He is Ivaros. Now we are three. I saw you last night, he says, drawing the church. Together we climb a sandy hill path in phase, stop to share some melon on a cafe table. As the heat of the day comes in and Lise and I change into shorts. Set off again, but Ivaros has seen another Lithuanian he has to talk with. He'll see us later and the triangle is broken, reverts to two. So um, many of you probably know that the Camino de Santiago was really established in medieval times. Um, and um, it was as popular then as it is now. Um, very, very many people walked the Camino um, from all over Europe and they were heading to the shrine of St. James, um, which is what Santiago means. Santiago is St. James in Spanish. Um, but the figure of St. James, uh, has a kind of slightly dark history. Um, it was kind of um, exploited and appropriated um, uh, for political reasons, for violent reasons, um, when, uh, if you imagine the time um, when there was uh, Moorish Spain um, being slowly taken over by Christian Spain, um, uh, in the medieval time. Um, so this figure of St. James is uh, slightly problematic um, to say the least. Uh, and um, I wanted to explore that and keep that um, and capture that in, in the poem um, and wrestle with it a little bit. Yeah, and I should say that St. James the way he was used later, not, not the original St. James, um, but anyway. Uh, okay, I think, Jasmine, can we go to the next page? Or I think maybe it's cut off the end. Hold on, I'll just find this in the book. Um, right, yeah. At Casto Harris, I enter the Church of the Apple, with its round red window. The door is open, it will close at 1400 hours. I don't know the time. The man at the desk taps the Donativo box. I tell him I want to look first, then decide. No, no, he insists, un euro. Pero no es Donativo. I slip the coin into the slot and start to look around at the exhibits. The church is a museum now. There is a statue of St. James on his horse, rearing up to trample a moor whose head is severed. Santiago Matamoros, St. James Moor Slayer, Saint Iago. Iago. My pilgrimage being done as I'm a Christian, in the circumstance of glorious war, my purse full of crusados, I have boarded, covered, topped, white steed, snorting, the savage moor, poor Barbary, kill in the dark. I have a sword of Spain and put it home. I took by the throat. We must obey the time. I don't know the time. The man is calling out and jabbing at his wristwatch. I've only just walked in, I haven't seen anything, but it's clear I'll have to leave. Pero un euro, I remind him. He's back behind the desk. Quiero un euro, he throws it down. Gracias. I fall out of the church into sunshine, crying. Courtney and Emily are passing, they scoop me up. I am confused, I hate the town. Uh, 
Um, so there is a rupture in the narrative, a kind of um, turning point uh, about two thirds of the way through um, when uh, my sister comes into the narrative, um, which uh, I have hope she doesn't mind. I've asked her um, if she doesn't mind me talking about this a little bit. Um, that um, So this was a moment of difficulty and challenge for us, a, a moment of, of tension. Um, and the way that that was expressed in the poetry um, was, it, well, it was very difficult actually to, to, to write about. Um, so I wrote this prose poem, which is a kind of exploration of the emotions that uh, I was experiencing at that time um, through an extended metaphor of the ocean and the seabed. So it's kind of seeing the process of the pilgrimage, the spiritual process, um, through a metaphor um, of being being in this underwater um, space. The ocean. Her idea of what she was doing, pool refresher, quick dip, lemonade and deck chair, was at odds with mine, what I was doing, still deep someplace, deep working, still unfinished cajoled to the surface, fussed over and interviewed. That was bound to frustrate me and I should evade it, staying in my zone. Or in trying to pull her under to join me at mud level, she was bound to kick against it. She, needing to stay at surface level and within sight of her babies floating in neon armbands around the islands like me sticking down deep on the seabed where properties were altering my composition in fundamental ways a process i was well engaged in must not now be interrupted and for which i had paid dearly snipping ties and swimming off by myself only this way can you reach the deep places where the root stems are pale and fleshy. Only here are the most tensile patterns visible. Trying to keep hold of those fibres while stretching out a hand to her was all but impossible. Bringing her down, she felt like she was drowning, lost and unguided in this dim lit underplace. The sandy path which reliably and safely wound down here, if only you could keep to it, was not familiar to her. She had not arrived by the path, but by sudden dive and submersion. And her trying to reach with the ends of her fingers to me, while keeping buoyed enough to wave across the water to the small ones, wasn't feasible either. She daren't reach me. And even this far from them was too far. She lost their photograph. She put herself out to where? And where did she want to go? Um, near the end of the walk, um, there were lots more, um, a lot more animals. Um, that's because uh, the last part of the walk is in Galicia, um, which is a very beautiful part of Spain, um, full of uh, kind of mountain farms. Um, and it actually, it's a little bit like Cornwall, um, I think, in the landscape. It's kind of, it's got these really lovely um, woodlands um, that remind me a bit of, of Cornwall. So um, it had a kind of ho homeliness to it, um, but also a kind of wildness. At Linares, I cook for Corey, Emily and Charlotte on the induction hob. Pasta, onions, garlic, tomato, olives and tinned mushrooms. This hostel's brand new like a glass box. After dinner, I step outside to where the shaggy cattle are tearing at the hay next door. The moon is nearly full again. Someone leads a group of cream-coloured cows and their bells go by. Then they give the, their colour to the sky as the mountains purple and darken. A dog shouts his way through, a person shouts to the dog. The cattle next to me stop their eating and begin to bellow. The traffic sound, insects, 
blackberries, all the voices of the pilgrim people, Australian, American. Night falls, the people keep their lights on. Don't forget to look at the moon. Praised be the creatures. I love that the words of the canticle may be said and read many times in meaning again and again indifferently. Um, so we're going to skip now to after the pilgrimage is over. Um, so the book actually uh, doesn't end with arriving at Santiago. There's a little bit more um, because the kind of process of the pilgrimage went on after after the pilgrimage was over. And it's, it, yeah, it's not over when you reach the destination. It carries on for a while. Um, and um, so there's a sec this section that called um, about 40 more days. A few days after coming home, I'm lying on my bed and this image comes to me. A yellowish layer of foam floating on the water surface. We spend most of our time there, drifting with the foam. Underneath an anchor and an iron hard bed of stone. I have the impression that this stone and anchor set deep underwater is reality. The foam, on the other hand, is actually unreal. The days on Camino were normal. It is the other way around. New leaves have fallen and we see the backs of the leaves like mirrors. Furry leaves in the wild garden by the blue bridge. People do sit on benches under the yellow crowd of the chestnut tree, looking at water. The round leaves of the birch flapping suddenly like a thousand tambourines. I go to church the first Sunday and cry. Inside, the stone is ribs and sinew, a growing body or canopy. Everyone is talking and reading the Bible in English, all of the ritual Spanish knocked awake in messages I can hear. They walk down the nave with the gospel, facing the huge, complicated west window. All of the heads of the people turn like sunflowers. The priest's a woman with shiny, short black hair. She tells us not to know is okay, to keep asking the questions. I kneel inside my scallop shell and pray pray, thank you for bringing me there and here. Um, so just before I, I end with this bit, um, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you um, to Carcanet. I want to thank everybody in the team. Um, thank you, Michael. Thank you, John, um, Andrew, Jazz, um, Alan, um, and Emily, who did the typesetting and was very patient with my very pernickety typesetting. Um, and sorry if I've missed anyone, but, but everybody. Um, and um, thank you to the people who helped me edit the poems. Um, they know who they are. Um, I think some of them are here. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, and a really big thank you to Sarah. Sarah's really um, read this book with such care and attention, um, as you'll, you'll see when we do the Q&A. And um, I'm really profoundly grateful for that and really touched. Um, so, so thank you very, very much. Jazz, can we just go one page on actually? Thank you. So we're at this point, we are actually back in Spain um, and this is Finisterre. So a lot of pilgrims um, walk just a few days longer than Santiago a, a further um, to get to the coast and, and, and go to Finisterre. And it's um, a kind of um, very mysterious, um, be beautiful place. Um, I, oh, sorry. Okay, the paths are a maze, switching back on themselves through forest. 
I know I no longer know if the town is this side or over there, which way to the sea. There are no arrows anymore. I drop down a slope, then I see the beach, cold scimitar lapped by teal Atlantic. It's lonely, looking out to a nothing in the west, turned away from the pilgrim paths. But my way twists again and dissolves into scrub and briars. The only way is up, to the left a sheer muddy chute not meant for feet. I retrace, turning away from the sea. I will just go back to the streets, the albergue. A wiry woman is power walking down the track in shorts and bum bag. Disculpe, I gulp, donde esta el pueblo? She looks me down, flicks away the map in my hand, then gestures to follow, never slackening her pace as she leaps down the hill, back to precisely the place that I've come from. Suddenly she stops, draws down her shorts and knickers and spreads her legs to do a wee in the middle of the gravel track. I wait awkwardly. My guide brings me down a narrow passage I hadn't noticed the first time around, hopping between stones. The path leads between two high walls and into a village. A pueblo, says the woman, pointing down a lane. Y la playa? She points in the opposite direction, then leaps away. There are signs. Playa peligrosa, dangerous beach. A long sequence of boardwalks zigzags over unstable dunes and patches of gorse like poisonous pools. There's a storm shifting in the clouds, turning this way. I sit in the sand for a moment as it stiffens and freshens, rain starting to paint the air. Just a few minutes more. My, am I right in thinking I come on now? I just want to say, wow, Phoebe, just what a beautiful reading. Um, and also, you know, you're so welcome. And um, it was a pleasure to read. Um, and I just I thought I ought to show just <laughs> how much I loved the book. I've made so many sort of notes and I'm going to be coming back to it again and again. Um, because I don't feel like I've got there yet, um, but I need more from it, and it keeps giving every time. Um, I just wonder whether we ought to start our chat by um, talking about Basho. <laughs> um, you didn't mention him, but I mean, obviously, you do reference him, um, and I know from our our conversations in the past that he's a huge influence and he is the epigraph he's one of the epigraphs to the book um, and you make lots of lovely references um, throughout the book to him and I wondered if if we could just kind of start by maybe talking about the early influence I know it was very early influence wasn't it for you yeah, um, yeah, I I love um, Basho, um, the Japanese poet of the uh, oh, is, is it the seventeenth or the eighteenth century? The end of the seventeenth century, I think. Um, and um, uh, yeah, well, um, I suppose while I was preparing to go on Camino, I was actually writing my MA dissertation, which was about um, the topic was Hyben, and you're probably thinking, what on earth is that? Um, it's basically um, the, a form of poetry which uses um, haiku um, mixed with prose, poetic prose. Um, and it's sort of associated with Basho um, because he wrote this beautiful um, text called The Narrow Road to the Deep North, which is a kind of travel, travel writing. Um, so it's a travel writing that's so poetic, it's very beautiful. Um, and there's nothing quite like it. There, there are people who have tried to do kind of um, modern hyben, and, and that's what I was looking at in my dissertation because I'm not a Japanese specialist. But um, 
but yeah um so I've read Basho in translation um and I really was very interested in the form um because it moves between prose and poetry or prose and verse um and I'm not very excited by haiku on their own when they're just presented in in the little um little units but I'm much more interested when when they're in a in a narrative and you have a kind of um uh sort of description of of actions that you'd expect from from almost from fiction or from um uh more associated with prose and then you get this really intense lyrical um moment in the haiku kind of bursting out of that or um i'm really interested in the kind of way that his poetry um creates that tension and allows you to sort of progress progress um in a linear way along a walk um which but also have these really sharp um moments of very poetic lyrical perception and i guess as a poet um i you know and a poet who was, was interested in walking and and in stories it, there's always this question of how, how are you going to um create a sense of linearity in, in poetry um if that makes sense absolutely yeah um and you can see wonderfully in the text how you've 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 used um haiku and haiban very you know i mean it's not tight you haven't got like sort of a, you know specific syllables for the smaller moments or anything like that but it's very gentle lucid um use of it um it's it's re quite remarkable um and it really seems to take the shape of your walk even though you know i have no real awareness of what the actual walk has walk look like um the form really conveys that i think that's really interesting yeah um it, and i'm assuming you know that it was a it was a very deliberate formal choice yeah it was and I, I did try I had a go at doing it in proper haiku with the syllables but it didn't really work and so I wouldn't call it I wouldn't really call what I've done as a, a hyphen really because it's not so strict um and the, and the and the, it's also not the prose isn't really prose it's something in between so so um but I, but yeah I was in I was so interested how, how in how are you go how am I going to um evoke the rhythm of a walk a long walk without it being really tedious and boring you know to kind of create the energy of that rhythm um somehow um in a verse form um which could contain all those sort of um more mundane things um or little kind of everyday details and people's comments and all those sort of surface things in a way um alongside the more kind of um epiphanic kind of uh moments which feel a bit different and I suppose the hyben help helped me to think okay there is almost this, there's different degrees here of 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 what I'm trying to express and sometimes in a very short lyric poem um I think it's hard sometimes to fit, have the expansiveness to to, to to express everything that I want to express so that was why um I need this form um yeah yeah that's that's great. I mean, it, it really works. Um, and you mentioned uh, during your reading that um, you had these moments of having sort of one, uh, having you started off on your own and then you had kind of two and then three and then you kind of moved in and out of different social groups. And that really reminded me of uh, the Basho um, book that you, you mentioned at the beginning. Um, and I was interested uh, in hearing a little bit more about, and you also mentioned this in your reading, um, the kind of use of voices, those voices that are feeding into those those social interactions along the way. I mean, I, I felt like there was a real polyphony and I, I, I was thinking about this this morning, actually, um, that that sense of it really reminded me of the the in fact, actually, I, we might have been talking about it the other day. Um, the St. James um, scallop shell. We might have been talking about it the other day. But the, the St. James scallop shell and all the different um, paths that you follow on that and, and having all those different voices. 
Um, and I, I wondered if you just say a little bit more about that and 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 the musicality behind behind the choices yeah. that you've made. Yeah, I love that idea of the of the shell and the lines on the shell being like the voices. Um, yeah, um, for me, the Camino is really um, about community, um, and that's why it's so special. Um, it's so. It, I guess one of the things that I was I was sort of dealing with on a personal level was how to balance my need to be alone and solitude with the desire for community and togetherness. And the Camino is kind of it enacts that a lot. Um, because there are times when you are alone um, and there's a, a lot of joy in that. Um, but also um, it's very, very social and busy and buzzy and, and there's lots of talking. Um, there's lots of talking and listening. And um, yeah, I guess that's just a, a huge part of where I get my inspiration from is, is from people's lives and people's stories um and I kind of I kind of want to po in my poetry for it to be sort of alive in that way and not and not kind of I suppose not definitely not just the single poet having their thoughts about whatever but also a bit more kind of um like listening um and and trying to but you know echo back what what's around um around me um and celebrate those things that that I've heard and often people I just I, I suppose I find it I, the way people speak can be really um fantastic and, and as a poet you sort of want to record that I'm a bit like a as I guess um yeah like a magpie for like things that people said <laughs> um and it can, can be a bit tricky you sort of don't want to offend anybody by using their things they've said but um in, for me, it's it's always meant really as a celebration of, of them. Um, so and yeah, uh, my Camino wasn't me; it was everyone. You know, it, it's, it's a collective experience. Yeah, that's wonderful, and I think you'd managed that really well. It's it feels like you create this wonderful communal space in the poetry and on the page, and. Um, that made me kind of think about one of the lines that you read, uh, you read this evening. Um, I think it's something like the days on the Camino were normal, if it's the other way around. Um, and that kind of made me think about the space that the Camino creates for uh, people, <laughs> pilgrims. The, the, and, and there was a recurring theme of escape as well which was really lovely. Um, and I wondered whether, um, you know, maybe maybe you could say a little bit about that. I know we've, we've kind of talked about it before, but kind of what is that space? You know, it's, it's a space I, I, I feel like I long for, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and you feel that it feels like you're very reluctant to leave in some ways as well. Definitely. Um, I, think, I think the experience of doing the Camino is quite... Um, life-changing for most people that do it most people I've spoken to would agree that um but it's so so when you finish you do what you kind of want to carry you know you do want to stay because it's so it's so ideal in lots of ways um but um some people kind of go back year after year for that reason and, and get too depressed at home <laughs> um but I I didn't want to do that and I don't think that's really the purpose of it I think it it's not it's not really meant to be an escape it's it's um something it's something we can find in our in our rest of our lives um it's just a very intense um experience um you know just because it you don't have all the distractions of of normal normal living and jobs of it partly just you know it's 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 this escape from all, all your responsibilities I suppose but it's it is more than that um and I guess, um, I, I, yeah, I do think that there are ways that you can bring the, the kind of um, sensibility of the Camino into, into all, all of our life. Um, and that that's really the, the gift of it. Um, or, you know, it's obviously not the only experience that can be like that. And 
if you've had an experience that that's made you realize that life could be lived in a slightly different way it's then it's a kind of invitation to think okay how can we do this in 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 our and the rest of our lives um and just and I'm, i mean this all might sound a bit abstract for, for, for people but i guess just to think of an example i guess um you know i um <laughs> I didn't I didn't use my emails at all um on, oh, on the lovely. commute. I know, <laughs> but but you sort and you sort of think and then but then when you come back you sort of think actually we don't need to live quite like this, you know. And like I know everybody has to be on email and we're here on Zoom and, and that's it's an idealistic situation, but or or maybe a bit I don't know, there's certain things where you think actually you it makes you realise what you actually need to live, what will make you happy, and you don't need very much is, is the truth, you know. And we sort of know that, but sometimes it takes a bit of a, an experience to to prove it <laughs> and realise what what we really need. Um yeah. So so there are lots of practical ways that people can live out the Camino and uh, or yeah and it's not the it's not like yeah it's not like some magic land where you have to you know it's still part of the real world <laughs> yeah and, and in some ways for me I felt like that was really um like quite politically radical um in the like the best way that uh, Christianity can be <laughs> it was really yeah it was really positive um kind of uplifting aspect of the book I'm gonna I'm gonna move on and ask some of these like, you've got amazing questions in in the question and answer box so I was just gonna ask a couple of them um so uh they're also quite a lot about um voices in community uh Catherine Olver Catherine Olver um asks did you tell any of the other pilgrims that you were planning to write a poem about the experience if so how did they react <laughs> <Don't know> the <laughs> <answer>. <laughs> well um so i didn't i wouldn't say i was planning to write a poem while i was right there i i had it i i thought i mean i was writing bits and pieces while i was there but i didn't know whether it would be a real poem or what i was doing I wasn't really thinking in that way while I was there I didn't really tell anyone particularly that I was a writer unless they asked me um I didn't well, not that I was keeping a secret but it wasn't really yeah I didn't say um I didn't really say that I might write about it um until the very end um because yeah it wasn't really relevant <laughs> Um, and, and actually, one of the lovely things about the, the pilgrimage is that everybody's job and normal occupation or normal identity gets a bit sort of um, anonymized because you're all together, together doing this strange experience. And people are more interested, really, in why you're doing it, not not really in your all the things you do normally in your habits at home and your roles at home. So it sort of came up a bit, but it's sort of not not the central thing. Um, and I kind of also, I was, um, I think it, it, it helped me to remember that, this is probably going to tell you a lot about me, but it helped me to remember that I, that being a poet's not all that special, actually, particularly. I, love I probably that. used to think <laughs> that I was a bit special because I write poetry, but actually everybody's absolutely special obviously so but you know this, oh, this and, and, and so many people on the Camino was, was uh, you know did such special creative things or or in in all kinds of ways um or or very um the, yeah um in in all kinds of professions or not professions or whatever but but yeah it wasn't really important yeah Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask um, two questions together. So I'm going to ask uh, Carol Boulter and uh, Briley Whitehead's questions together. So uh, Carol says, a great poem and an inspiration. Did you actually write every day? And uh, Briley says, how much of the book did you write on the pilgrimage and how much afterwards? It's a good process. Yeah, uh, really good questions. Um, well, um, I did write every day when I was there. I wrote every day, I didn't actually read anything. So one of the things I didn't do was read, um, which was quite an interesting thing to do. But anyway, that's slightly separate. But, um, and I, I wrote in 
two notebooks. I had a notebook that was like in the pocket of my rucksack so I could get it out and make a note while I was sort of on the way. And I did that quite a lot. And then the little kind of haiku like poems that we've been talking about that Sarah's mentioned, a lot of them did start as poems that were just quite spontaneous and quick to write on, on the actual walk. Um, but I also wrote, um, I kind of kept a journal as well in another notebook, which I used to write in at the end of the day. Um, and um, so some of those little poems and little scraps of things did end up in the book. Um, but I did, my journal isn't what I have published at all. The journal's different. Um, when I got back, um, I started from scratch and I was writing from memory, from my, from my memory, really. Um, and some of the things in the journal were quite useful because to like remember names or remember specific facts really. Um, but but it was a, such a kind of intense time that it was really clear in my memory. So it was easy actually to kind of write it up <laughs> or like write write the poem. Um, and it, yeah, so it was a different a different stage in the process. But then it went through lots of drafts, and the form was a total nightmare to get right, and it took ages, and was overhauled a lot. So it wasn't yeah, it was quite laborious. Great answer. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the uh, last two, but I'll ask them separately because they're a little bit different. Um, so Nell Prince asks, how much is the psychogeographical collection? How much is this a psychogeographical collection? Does it work with and escape the popular term? Ooh. <laughs> oh, one question. Um, <laughs> ooh, um, okay, ooh, interesting one. Okay, psychogeographical. I mean, kind of, yeah, it, I suppose it is. I think it's, it's not really urban, which I, I associate with psychogeography stuff more. It's not really like the Flaner figure skulking around the urban which I would think of as a psychogeography but it is it is in the sense that it's a walk um and uh it's kind of absorbing the surroundings and recording and sort of the the poet speaker is a kind of camera in a way um which a kind of absorbing things that are around, around her so um I would say you could probably use that term um and consider it <laughs> I like that. I, I I like the idea that maybe you've invented a new genre, um, like a slightly more chilled out pilgrim <laughs> psychogeography. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so uh, Laura uh, Blumble, uh, sorry if I've got your name wrong, Laura, um, asks, did your relationship to the Catholic Church change during the pilgrimage and the writing of this book? which I think is a really interesting question. I did have a quite a similar question to that, but um, I think Laura puts it better. Um, well, I guess, okay, the Catholic Church is quite specific. Yeah, I suppose the pilgrimage yeah. is, is, is Catholic, really, yeah. Um, um, well, did it change? Um, yeah, I think I understood a bit more, a lot more about the Catholic Church from doing the pilgrimage. Um, and... Um, there was sort of questions that it raised. Um, there were sort of, so I suppose though I'm somebody who's very drawn to churches um, and interested in churches and church, um, but lots of people who walk the Camino and are not, and they don't go into any of the churches. Um, and so it's sort of a, something that comes up on the way is sort of, are you some? Do you, are you going to go to the mass or not? Or are you? You know, are you going to? And some people say, "Oh no, I'm not here for that. that I don't like the. I don't like the church at all." Um, and um, one of the questions uh, among the the other women that I was with was was a lot about kind of um, lack of female leadership in the Catholic Church and how we found that quite alienating. Um, go, going to all these masses with with the male priests. Um, and and so we'd have a kind of conversation and a debate about that. Um, so it kind of brought up these issues um, and yeah, helped me, I don't know, I think in some ways it made me, um, I don't know, yeah, it, it was, it, it, 
also there's a lot of Spanish people and Italian people who are Catholics who do the Camino in a slight and they have a slightly different relationship to it as as people from Catholic countries um, and it's more of a heritage thing um, in a way a kind of I mean a celebration of their of their culture and heritage um, so I don't really know Laura I think I think um, yeah it basically it brought up a lot of interesting issues um, but coming back I guess I didn't really think it, yeah, that, that I'll leave it there, I think. <laughs> uh, it's a tough question. I mean, there are moments in the, the book where you seem to like alight on little bits that you don't, you don't like, <laughs> you quite assertively don't like. And there's that, um, interesting and slightly horrible moment in the church with the donation box the man with the donation box who's very insistent that you donate and um there's obviously saint james and the relationship with um racism uh and the other a couple of other bits i think and 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 you actually actively stand up at one point and sort of talk about uh i, I can't remember if it's a prayer meeting or you're just you're asking questions at one point and you say about the world being better in some way help me out here here Phoebe um. yeah, yeah. it's basically <laughs> anger because the the women wouldn't stand yeah. up and, for themselves and say their names in the patriarchal yeah. situation um <laughs> and then me wanting to stand up and say something but just deciding not to <laughs> yeah. um yeah uh so yes it brought up a lot of frustration i think so basically in i mean it's a bit personal really but um it, while i was on camino i wanted to become a christian but i was very afraid and um part of that was feeling like what's this church you know all of this stuff that i can't agree with um so it's a wrestling with that and a kind of anger that's actually a desire to be included in it as well um so there's that tension um and yeah i don't know uh, uh, coming to faith and and being um part of a church doesn't mean that those questions go away you know that they're, they're still there and that's that's part of what what people in the church are also wrestling with so so it's um an ongoing kind of set of issues um but yeah all those problems and issues I wanted to be in the book because I didn't want it to be like oh a lovely spiritual time you know it's 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 not simple it's complicated um and the institution makes it complicated um but is also valid and valuable in other ways so um yeah it's not a book that solves any of those questions it's just trying to be true to what the Camino really is which is which is a place where some of those things get teased out and explored um but i mean overall i would say it it just it's fantastic it's um it's 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 goes beyond all of these um problems and difficulties that we as humans make actually i really do did find that um and so that's i guess what i would hope would come across in the end and, and yeah it's great. Um, I, I'm going to draw it to a, a close and hand over to Jazz in a minute. But I just, I just want to say thank you for putting that out there. I feel like I've spent the last uh, four years under a PhD, four years dealing with some of that stuff, and I felt like you did make a space in the book. And those questions about who belongs here are really, really valid and helpful. Um, in a lot of people's faith journeys today and uh, yeah just brilliant thank you so much Phoebe um I will uh, we better hand over to Jazz now because it's eight o'clock but yeah I'm very sorry Jenny that I can't ask your amazing question either but maybe maybe Phoebe could um let you know in the chat chat about that okay I'll hand over to Jazz <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much um it's been a really, really lovely evening. Um, thank you and congratulations, of course, Phoebe, um, on the new book. And thanks, Sarah, for hosting. It's been uh, really, really wonderful. Um, thank you guys all for being here so much. Um, I do want to apologise to those of you who have already purchased the book and have 
yet to receive it. Um, I'm assured it should be with you within the next week. Um, so please bear with us. We've had some technical difficulties, um, which are all in hand now, and you'll get them very soon. For those of you who haven't yet bought your book, um, please use the discount code. It's in the chat for you. Um, there's a link there. You've got a few weeks to use that on the website. Um, buy loads of copies, buy them for your friends and your family, please. Um, if you don't want to do that right now, just check your emails tomorrow and it'll come as an automatic email so you can get your discounted copy of the book. Um, and if you've got any problems, obviously just get in touch with us and we'll do our best to help you. Um, so. I think that's really everything. Um, thanks again, guys. Um, please join us next time. Um, our next launch is on the 8th of May. We're launching a new Car Connect classic, um, which is uh, The Last Girl Notebooks by Jean-Luc Champre, edited and translated by Philip Terry. Um, that's in the chat too. Check our website. Um, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. So um, thank you, Sarah. And thank you so much, Phoebe. Um, I'll leave the chat open for you guys for just a couple of minutes, but um, that's everything from us. So good night.